If you have a copy of the Bible, you're welcome to open it up this morning to the next passage where we left off last week um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you don't have a copy of the Bible or if you don't have a copy of the Bible in a translation or a language that's really easily understood by you, uh, let me remind you that we always have copies available in the foyer on the free resource table. Um, they, they look just like this. It's our pleasure to give them to you for free, so don't try to pay us. That'd be, don't make it weird. Just take the Bible and read it. Uh, we would love to serve you like that. If you're reading one of these Bibles, uh, this is going to be on page, page way in the back, page 576. Um, I shared with some of y'all this week that this is a particularly challenging passage. Um, we'll see that in a minute. But even as we read these words and are, are struck by the strangeness of them, listen very carefully. Because this is God's Word. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling, Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what's proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I don't permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet, she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Y'all, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, this word is too great for us. And would you give us supernatural insight? Would you send your Holy Spirit to fill our minds and our hearts? We're very weak. We, we can't understand anything, especially challenging things, even things that strike us as offensive. We certainly could never be saved by hearing this word apart from you. But with you, there is such great power and such great mercy. You are so invested in our eternal salvation and in the good works and obedience we show you in this life. So would you, over anyone else, would you please help us to understand? Not just to understand, but to embrace this as a way of life that is true and good for all people. Would you make this word that has been thrown out, would you make it bear 30, 60, 100 times more than what we invested at this morning? not only for our joy, and not only for the good of our neighbors, but, Lord, for your greater glory in this world. Please help us now, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Is Christianity good for women? That's what this paragraph makes us ask, right? I could talk for a really long time about all the ways that Jesus and his church restore everything good that women and men need. But y'all, we just ain't got time for me to wax poetic in the introduction. Let's skip it for now. And so let's just dive right in to this challenging but true passage. The, the big idea this morning as we focus particularly on verses 9 through 15, the big idea, if you're a note taker, is simply healthy churches include others-focused women of character. If one Savior desires to be even healthier as a church, and we long to see more and more churches in Effingham and beyond grow in their spiritual health, and they must be churches that include others-focused women of character. To say it up front, this will be the first of another two-part series. There's uh, just a whole, This is like going to the Chinese restaurant as a pastor. My eyes are very big but our stomachs collectively cannot handle all that has to be unpacked, not only for us to understand, but to love and embrace these words. So, so this week, we're just going to have to focus on just part of this paragraph. So y'all hang with me, right? If, if we want to be a church that more and more cultivates and, and disciples and encourages others-focused women of character, then there's really two things that we need to see this morning. First, this is from verses 9 to 10. 
Healthy churches include women who are focused on serving others. Focused on serving others. Let, let me show you all my math here. Um, but let me start by showing my math, and, and let me just quickly get it out of the gate. Let's talk about what Paul is not saying in these verses. Y'all are certainly not unintelligent people. I don't mean to imply otherwise. But because of the culture we, we live in and the cultures that we have lived in, we are very quick, and I'm not in the least bit judgmental of anyone who takes offense at this paragraph, it's really struggles. Even if you are someone who's submitted to God's word and you want to know more, to really know what to do with it can be tricky. So let's start with what Paul is not saying. Here, Paul is not saying women should never dress up. Just not true. That, that, that's not just because I, I want that to be the case. Look at the words themselves. Look at verse 9, which begins with the word, likewise. That, that, could, that teaches us, let's be good students of the Bible, that teaches us to look back at the previous verse, verse 8, where Paul gives a specific shout-out to the men of the church that they should be people who pray with peace and forgiveness between them. But do you see what happens in verse 8? There's another one of those hook words that connects us to go back. Verse 8 says, I desire then. So this whole thing is connected to something that came really at the beginning of chapter 2. Y'all remember from last week's sermon that chapter 2, starting in verse 1, leading into this, all this is flowing out of a big conversation really about what? About prayer meetings. About what Christians do when we come together. And, and first off, of first importance, Paul says in verse 1, we pray together. And all of this conversation is flowing out of how do Christians conduct themselves when we come together for worship? You, you see that, right? That, that little word likewise in verse 9 has got to introduce us to that context. Otherwise, we will completely take this out of context. Paul really specifically has in mind how Christians behave when we come together in worship gatherings. And so in that context, Christian women should not be overly focused on how they look. That's kind of the 30,000-foot view, right? Secondly, ooh, in this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like, right out the gate, if y'all get mad at me, usually, like, preachers wait till the end to get the congregation mad. I'm just going to not intentionally step on toes, but I'm going to, as, as I heard a country preacher say one time, I'm going to stop preaching. I'm going to start meddling. I'm going to start meddling in the first five minutes of the sermon. Paul is not saying that modesty and self-control in this context are talking about showing too much skin. That's not what modesty and self-control are referring to in this context, right? And I know that can be tricky for us to understand because many of us, men and women, who grew up in our churches, especially in evangelical cultures like we want to be a part of, we read the word modesty, and we can't help it. Our minds jump right to, don't be scantily clad. Right? That's, that's what we all, men and women, have been trained to think. And that word certainly can mean that in other contexts. What do I mean? Look, look further. Look at Paul's actual words, brothers and sisters. In both the culture of Paul's day, of the Roman world 2,000 years ago, and in our day, Fancy hairdos and wearing gold and pearls and costly attire, let's retranslate that, expensive clothes, presenting yourself like that as a woman did not communicate sexual immorality. That's not really what's in view. And, and let me just make an aside here because I, I, I told the elders and other folks a significant part of my counseling ministry as a pastor is among other things helping women my age or older to understand that the conversation around modesty and self-control has sometimes done more harm than good. What do I mean by that? Sometimes out of a real desire to serve Jesus' church and to obey his word, the church has both hurt and misdiscipled women. Because when we talk about modesty and self-control, Sometimes, some Christians have communicated women are, intentionally or otherwise, a threat to the chastity and the sexual purity of men in the church. And that means, therefore, we have to police very closely what women wear. More closely than we police the dudes, at least. 
Brothers and sisters, I, I'm, I'm poking fun at that, but I know from conversations I've had with y'all face to face, we have a really jacked up understanding of modesty and self-control because of the way that's sometimes applied. So again, don't take my word for it. Look at what Paul's talking about. Look at what he actually says. He's not making blanket statements implying that Christian women are seductresses. No, not at all, right? If we read Paul's instructions for the women of the church to be modest and self-controlled in the way that they dress, and our minds jump straight to seduction and sexual immorality, that actually says a lot more about how we've been discipled by our culture than we have been discipled by the Scriptures. It, it, and, and let's just take a... This is the last little bit of my soapbox, I promise. If we have subtly implied, we as individuals or as a church, if we have subtly implied that women are dangerous and they are to be dealt with very carefully, then we have accidentally or not twisted God's word. And we've abused our sisters in Christ. And we have hindered our mission to make disciples of new people. So if we've done that, Jesus provides us with the best way out ever. We can just be honest about it and own up to our terrible sins, and we can change with the power of the Spirit. We can can repent of making those mistakes. So, off my soapbox. Okay, Paul's not saying women should ever dress up, and Paul is not saying that women are all seductresses, and therefore they have to be covered from head to toe. So what is Paul saying? What did fancy hairdos and gold and pearls and expensive clothes communicate? Surprisingly, or not, They communicated back then what they still communicate today. What do those show off when we we see women or men dressed like that? It shows wealth. When you see someone wearing costly attire, and if I can put it in uh, in our our good southern, I know we have some Midwestern visitors, I'm sorry, y'all. If I can put it in our good southernisms, um, people who are very put together. What does a very put together person, particularly maybe a woman, communicate? Wealth and energy and time that have been invested in coming across that way. I mean, again, the the word, the phrase, costly attire, makes that plain. The temptation Paul is concerned about here is not, first and foremost, sexual immorality when the church gathers, but first and foremost, showing off how much money you have. It's a pride issue. It's an arrogance issue. It's the temptation to use our resources wrongly for selfish, boastful attention-seeking in the middle of church gatherings. I, I, I got a, a weird, I, I, I'm, I'm maybe like y'all, I'm very weirded out by social media sometimes. We'll come back to social media in a minute. I get the weirdest targeted ads on social media because I guess I like pastor stuff or whatever. Um, I got uh, I, I got a um, an unsolicited video on Instagram this week of a woman, young woman in her twenties, um, doing sort of a time lapse video in a step by step process of exactly how she gets ready for church every Sunday. Um, and it's it's I, it's not maybe what you think because this woman really clearly goes to a church that's like ours. We we do not expect people to dress up at all, um, but the amount of time and the number of steps. And frankly, the amount of money it costs to buy the clothes and the makeup to look like she just rolled out of bed. Um, I'm I'm not knocking that fashion style at all, but the amount of time and money and energy it spent to get ready for church, um, it may be culturally one more reason. I guess I'm happy I'm a dude because everyone rightly has very low expectations for how I look, I guess. Um, But also, it it was a perfect illustration of, of what this is saying here. Be very careful whether, you, whether it looks like um, you're very dressed up and that kind of put together or whether it's clear if you have a discerning eye, maybe as one woman to another, I know that her outfit took a lot of money and time to get together. Whatever end of the spectrum we're on, Paul is saying, Timothy, if you're going to plant a healthy church, if you're going to lead a healthy church, don't let the women and the men, but don't let the women spend so much time trying to grab attention for themselves in how they present themselves. Because when individual church members ought to have our hearts and our minds focused on the greatness of our God and all that he's given us freely in Jesus, of the great needs of our church and other churches in the area, of the tremendous need of the world around us, 
it is a terrible and a terribly sad thing to tempt the church by saying, in effect, stop looking at Jesus. Look at me. What a terrible and a terribly sad thing that would be. And, and remember, y'all, I'm, I'm going I'm to say it one more time. Uh, I said it last week as well. Look at verse 8. Just because Paul tells the men to be praying in the church does not mean only the men should pray, right? For, for reasons that we don't know, it was particularly important at that time for him to tell the men of the church to pray. In the same way, just because Paul tells the women to dress in a way that's, that's humble and not self-seeking for worship gatherings, that doesn't mean that men can wear whatever they want. That They actually can show off, and it's just the, the women who have to be modest and self-controlled. No, 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 no. Paul's point is, Timothy, make sure, make sure that when the church gathers, all people, and particularly the women in his context, are not seeking to steal attention from Jesus by drawing attention to themselves, even in ordinary ways like clothes and how we dress. Right? That, that's a good warning for all of us, men and women. But since Paul, for whatever reason, focuses on women, that's why I'll do the same. So in, in this sermon, I'm going to regularly address the women of the church, my sisters in Christ. Please don't hear that as me condescending or, or speaking down to you. I, I, the same, absolutely everything I say goes for the men of the church as well, right? But sisters, why is it truly, it truly is, why is it so hard for us all, and you as an individual, to want to shift others' attention away from yourself? Why is that so hard for, for us and for you? Let me reference Instagram twice in one sermon. I'm sorry. Um, it's just appropriate. Someone in our community group uh, shared this story that they were driving down the road this week and they heard a radio ad, maybe you've heard it too, um, of a class action lawsuit that's being filed, and the attorneys are soliciting other folks who might want to jump in on this. The class action lawsuit is against the parent company of Facebook and Instagram. And the ad says something like this, are you someone who has been damaged by social media? Because social media has made you overly self-conscious about the way you look. If so, cash in. I, I'm not at all qualified to speak on whether that case has any legal standing. I don't know if anyone's going to get paid for that. But we only sort of halfway laugh at it, don't we? None of us would laugh too much at that idea that social media has made us a little more self-conscious about the way that we look. Even, even if you are not on social media, and that's not your thing at all, wouldn't we all acknowledge that for the last 20 years since social media reared its head, it has not been easier in our culture to humbly point attention away from ourselves. Whether you have an account or not, it, it hasn't gotten easier in our culture to, to stop saying me, 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 and point to others. No. It, sisters, I say that because you and I are all fighting a terribly uphill, difficult climb. Um, and the Bible makes it abundantly clear what this radio ad doesn't. Our rebellion against God's good plan, our attention-seeking, our glory-starved hearts, the problem is not with Instagram, with Facebook, with TikTok, or any other social media channel. Y'all, the problem is not ultimately about the clothes that we wear. Because if you're concerned about that, if, if sin is the issue, sisters, put on all the sweaters. Wear the longest skirts, have the plainest hairdo, and you will be a homely-looking, prideful person in your heart. That, that's, that's the truth of the Scriptures. That's not just me making that up. Jesus himself tells his disciples, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. They defile a person. That's Mark chapter 7. 
dear sister, social media is only a spark, um, the fuel for the fire uh, of, of, of your temptation to arrogance and pridefulness and attention seeking. The fuel for the fire is already inside each one of us. It's in our prideful hearts that are so selfish, that are so starved for others to pay attention to us. Why does your heart and why does my heart so desperately want other people to pay attention to us? There are a thousand different reasons, a thousand different circumstances in your life that could shape your story of why you so desperately hunger for that. But I I think I'm not being overly simplistic when I say to you, dear sister, as a sinner like me, that you and I are tempted to spend way too much money and way too much time on how we look at church. It's because deep down, at, at the core of who we are, something that human effort and positive self-talk, all of the best help in the world, apart from supernatural intervention, is just not going to make that hunger go away. That craving that's deep down at the core of who you are in your heart. But, dear sisters, such good news. Such good news for people who cannot help themselves. Dear sisters, because of the Spirit of God, who has who's come to you who believe, and who is filling you, even as I'm preaching the sermon, you, dear sisters, actually do want to obey Jesus. I don't have to preach to a hostile crowd, because if you have the Spirit of God in you, even if I goof this sermon up very badly, He will continue to stoke up in you love and faith and hope. I know I'm talking to women, as my fellow members of the church, who actually want to dress modestly and with self-control. Y'all, y'all's hearts are being changed day by day to give God the attention that he wants, especially whenever we gather together to worship him. And if you have begun to follow Jesus, then like we saw in Romans 6 that we heard read during the singing, like we saw in Romans 6, you, dear sister who believe in Christ, you really don't have to sin anymore. This is the good news for sinners. You really can change. Your desires now actually can be met because you've got outside help. You've got outside supernatural help to change. How, how is that? How do, how do people change? In some ways, that's the question of every sermon, isn't it? How do people change? I'll tell you this much. Our hearts don't change because we look at them under a microscope. Our hearts don't change because we get real morbidly self-introspective trying to suss out, is that a good desire of my heart or is that a bad one? Am I, am, I, am I putting this on today? Am I putting makeup on or am I styling my hair this way to get attention from people? Or is it because I change when we take our eyes off of ourselves and we look to someone else? Sisters, I, I, I'm preaching, I'm telling you something you already know, so let me remind you maybe for the millionth time. Sisters, remember your humble others-centered Savior. Remember Jesus. Because your Lord Jesus was the most modest person who ever lived. The Gospels show us that on every page, don't they? They they don't show us that by commenting on exactly how many inches below the knee Jesus' robe hung. That's, That's not what they show at all. But how do they show Jesus in his perfect modesty? In how unpretentious he was as he quietly served the people around him and met their real needs. Y'all remember what he told those who gathered around him as disciples. This is Mark chapter 10. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve to give his life as a ransom for many. Sisters, Jesus Christ came into the world for you and for your salvation. In the ways that he drew attention to himself, he only did it for our good so that more people would know about him and trust and receive his offer of forgiveness and change that at the cost of his own life, you, dear sister, and billions of other women like you would live forever. And in his death on the cross, the Lord Jesus 
killed the power of pride in allowing himself to be murdered by his own creation. He mortally wounded selfishness. It is still alive, but one day it will be no more. And because of him, and because you, sister, have come to trust in him, that means Jesus has already dealt with your pride. He's already dealt with your heart's hunger to seek glory. Those things are on a countdown, y'all. One day, they will be fully and finally gone, and you will be fully and finally freed from that temptation you cannot seem to shake yourself from. So what? So we worship this Jesus. We thank him. We recognize he is a good Savior. Whatever he says is actually good and for our good. There's no, there's no tension between serving Jesus and doing what's right. No, this Jesus has saved you, dear sister, from all your sins. And there's nothing he could ask of you that would be beyond the pale. There's nothing this Jesus would command you to do or be that's not good for you or for the world. So how do the women of a healthy church worship him? Not not just with their words, right? It's not just with their clothes either. Look at verse 10. Our words and our clothes are just the notable signs and the noticeable signs of a changed heart, one that is genuinely growing more and more interested in other people and what they need and less and less interested in ourselves. And by comparison, because of Jesus, Christian women can be the first to say, I'm just not overly impressed with myself. That's not self-deprecating or or self-loathing. I just, I'm grateful for who God made me to be, but I, I don't have to be that impressive. So I'm not going to try. Do you realize how precious that freedom is? It it took the life and death of the Son of God to win that for you. To be able to say, I'm actually more interested in what other people need because I don't, I mean, I matter, I'm dearly loved, I'm precious to this good God who made me and who saved me, but I do not have to impress the people of One Savior Church by what I wear today. I don't have to impress the people in my community group. I don't have to impress the people of the prayer meeting on Sundays. I I can just focus on other people and let the chips fall where they may. That is freedom, sister. That is freedom. But that's the tricky thing about humility, right? It's really, really shy. If you go looking for humility in yourself or in somebody else, the last thing humility will do is to stand up and wave and say, Hey, here I am. I'm humble. So how do you see humility at work in your own heart and life or in the lives of of others in our church, the people that we want to be more interested in, that we want to encourage and support more? How do we see humility? Paul shows us in verse 10. We see modesty and self-control at work when we see women who are rightly professing godliness, to use the translation we have. Um, what is fitting for women who are not overly concerned with the fit of their clothes? Good works, which is a big old umbrella of possibilities. In the Bible, good works are they're not hard to identify. Good works are not good vibes floating around in the air like smoke rings. I think I do good works. Don't, don't press me to name any, but I'm, I'm a good works person. Y'all, the the good works of the Bible are personal. They're they're concrete. If humility would would let it happen, you could take a picture of someone doing a good work. It's it's that specific. So, So how should women dress, air quotes intended? Ultimately, Paul shows us, with something that's greater than clothes. What is the way that a a godly and a mature woman and man presents herself or himself? How, do we, how are we dressed when we come to church with a real record of real service to real people? That's how 
women and men, clothe and present ourselves in church gatherings and at home and at work and beyond. Y'all, if you follow Jesus and you want to kill your heart's sinful craving for attention, particularly in worship gatherings, it's, it's really simple. If you want to kill that ugly temptation, ask the Spirit to shift your focus to serve other people. Y'all, once again, y'all heard me say this a thousand times, simple almost never means easy. But it's not overly complicated. It is, in the mercy of God, it is blessedly simple to be humble. Because if you follow Jesus, his spirit is already primed and and ready to go inside of you. So asking him, would you, I don't even know if it's going to be a new discipline or a new habit I need to develop. I don't know if it's going to be something that's such a slow drip, drip, drip. I don't notice it happening. But spirit, you who are the spirit of Jesus, the one who empowered this man who is also God to a life of humility and service to others, if you would do it for him and I'm united to him, and you're in me, then would you please make me copy Jesus better? Serve other people until it doesn't even enter your mind to seek attention for yourself. That's, that's a lifelong project. But it's a doable project if, dear sister, you have the Spirit of Jesus dwelling inside you. And at the risk, at the risk of completely undermining everything Paul says here about humility... Let's, let's encourage, let's stir up that kind of humility, that, that kind of focus on other people by honoring women in our church who model this for us all. Let's, let's, let's imitate what Paul says in Romans chapter 13. Let's give honor to whom it's due. Um, it's been said, I think rightly, that what we celebrate reveals what we value. We can say whatever we want, but whatever is worth in our minds, throwing a party for. Whatever we bring up front in our gatherings, whatever we don't just talk up but celebrate, that's, that's what's really actually important to us. I think, I think that's true. From the Bible, God so values his son that he celebrates him publicly. The father so loves and treasures his own son that not only in his baptism where he says for all to hear, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. In his resurrection from the dead, the father makes a really big deal out of Jesus. He celebrates him. So how do we celebrate humility as people who want to value humility more and more? It's tricky, right? Because the moment like we call humility up front, it goes and like, hides in the parking lot. That's not humility's thing. <laughs> Um, so, so let's say this, brothers and sisters, let's honor the women that, of One Savior Church who are devoting their lives to serving others. Let's be a church who honors women who are serving their young children really well, whether they stay at home with their children or whether they work outside the home. Let's honor women like that. Let's celebrate the women of One Savior who work tirelessly to champion the good missions of their workplaces. Let's, let's, let's not be a church that shames women who work outside the home. Instead, let's honor those who educate our community's children, who serve the sick and the weak in Effingham with compassion and with dignity. Let's, let's encourage and honor women who lead their workplaces to meet the needs of the needy and the poor. Let's, let's be big fans of them and privately and publicly celebrate the good works they're doing in Jesus' name. Let's let's cheer on women who have given up their own lives to support their aging relatives. Let's cheer on the women who provide those women with a network of support and help. Y'all, let's let's make a big deal out of Christian women. (laughs) Let's celebrate when we see Jesus lived out in their lives. Because if we want to grow even more healthy as a church, y'all, we need our women to be more and more others-focused, women of character, than they already are. When we see that, we make a big deal out of it. Because that's the work of Jesus' Spirit in the lives of our church's women. And it's also the work of Jesus' Spirit in all of our lives when we all honor and encourage the women of one Savior in their good works. It's a big deal. It is not to be assumed or overlooked. That is is part of God's all-knowing plan 
to build healthy churches, which is what this letter is showing us over and over again in, in sometimes uncomfortably practical ways. Among other things, the Apostle Paul, sent by Jesus, is telling Timothy, son, the women of the church need to be people of character just like the men do. They're not second-class Christians. Their growth in spiritual health matters to the whole church's life. They matter. They have value, Timothy. They belong just like the brothers do. And their growth in spiritual maturity is a key piece of the church in the city of Ephesus holding up the gospel for all to see and supporting the gospel with their lives as, here's that phrase from chapter 3 again, a pillar and buttress of the truth. There's one one more verse in this paragraph that's getting at a really similar point. And that's verse 15. Y'all remember how last week I said that this paragraph is, objectively, the most debated passage in the entire New Testament. At least for the last 30, 40 years. I think if you just skimmed this paragraph with your eyes, maybe letting them linger a little bit extra over verses 11 through 14... I think you could understand why I don't want to try to tackle everything in one sermon. I assume that at some point you want to eat lunch. I love all y'all, but of all the people I don't want to tick off, I do not want to tick off the people in the nursery this morning because I went an hour over. So y'all just bear with me cutting it short this week. If, If you're dying to know more of what Paul says in this paragraph, come back next week. Because that's what we're going to be doing next week. Next week we'll be focusing on verses 11 through 14, which, which raise this question, what does the Bible say about the relationship between men and women in a healthy church? I got 10 pounds of sausage, and I only got 5 pounds of casing. So, sorry, I'm, going to try, I'm not going to try and stuff it all in. I am convinced, though, that verse 15, as, as honestly weird as it might strike us, actually fits better in this sermon on the character of Christian women. But it's not the easiest thing in the world to explain. Healthy churches include other focused women of character. and that, that means the church's women are going to be more focused on serving other people and their needs, much more than they're focused on bringing attention to themselves. Right? That's the first point. But it also means the second and last point. Healthy churches include women who are focused on God's calling. Women who are not just focused on others and their needs, but on on God and His calling on them as women. Remember, Paul has been telling Timothy about the importance of how Christians conduct themselves during church gatherings. In particular, that we should be humble, a humble people. So, let me try to obey Paul. Let me humble myself in front of you right now. I am not entirely sure what verse 15 means. Can I, can I humble myself? It's really difficult for the kind of guy who ends up as a pastor to say, I don't know. Entire books have been written about this one verse. Other books have been written to answer the arguments made in those books. Many of those books were written by humble, brilliant people who love Jesus and they come to radically different opinions and interpretations. That, that, that does not mean this verse has no meaning. That we should just throw up our hands in the air and say, oh, well, we're essentially going to pretend like it's not even in the Bible. Because who knows? No, no, it doesn't mean that. But it should make all of us just pump the brakes and slow down before we say, oh, psh, 1 Timothy 2.15. Super obvious. I was at a party recently and catching up with an old friend I hadn't seen in a while, um, and he asked me a really interesting question. He asked, as a pastor, do you ever tell people when you don't understand something in the Bible? That is one of the best questions I have been asked in a really long time. Because on the one hand, healthy churches need pastors who are confident in what God's Word makes plain. No no church becomes healthier because their pastor's wishy-washy about plain and important truths. No. If I, y'all, let's get get specific. If I, as one of your pastors, am not rock-solidly confident 
in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us and our salvation, the kindest thing you can do for me and for one Savior is to dismiss me as your pastor. Do not let me be wishy-washy on things God makes plain. On the other hand, being a pastor can tempt me to think something like this. Because I do know some things, some of which are eternally important. I have a master's degree in all this stuff. Therefore, I know pretty much everything. Y'all, can I, let me just be very vulnerable and honest. That tension of, of how, how transparent and honest can a pastor be at a church has been so clearly on display across our country, but also at One Savior since 2020. The other elders and I, we had to make really important decisions starting about 2020 that called for more expertise than we have just because we're elders and pastors. We had to make judgment calls on things that being an elder didn't automatically solve for us. I think it's really important for me as a disciple to admit this. There is a whole lot about COVID and epidemiology and public health I do not understand. I'm not qualified to speak authoritatively on so much of those things. There's a whole lot about politics that is not addressed specifically in the Bible. And so I really don't have the authority or the cred to speak to certain political questions. Y'all, racism is undeniably an evil, evil sin that reveals the brokenness of our world. But that does not mean, because the Bible condemns it, that I know any better than you, or even any better than some non-Christians how our society as a whole ought to specifically address racism. All that's to say, it is important for my spiritual health to admit when I do not know something. And and for whatever reason, I know it raises the temperature in the room 5 or 10 degrees when your pastor stands up front and says he doesn't know something, even about the Bible. So let let me humble myself before you because, one Savior, it is important for you to know that I don't know everything. That knowing the Bible like a pastor ought to does not make me qualified to speak to everything. The scriptures are sufficient for everything we need for life and godliness. But there are many things, even that are revealed in scripture, that I don't understand like I ought, or like I wish I did. So when I read verse 15, I do know some things. You and I together can know some things. We do know that Paul is not saying that women are saved by the mere act of giving birth. Saved through childbearing does not mean that. Remember, this is the same Paul writing actually to the same church in the city of Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, the same Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And as if that was not clear enough, this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Y'all, there will not be a single person in heaven who has escaped hell to live forever with God because of their fertility. Not one. I also know, and so can you, that inspired by the Holy Spirit and sent out by Jesus as his apostle, Paul, in writing verse 15, is right. Paul is not saying something that's incorrect. He's not saying something that was true at the time, but now we've all matured and now we can move past Paul. No, no, brothers and sisters, not at all. Paul is right. But my interpretation of what Paul is saying is very much up for debate. I am not an apostle. I am not given that authority. I am only to be listened to insofar as I tell you what God's Word says. And with me saying up front, I think I have an idea of what this verse might be saying. I hope, brothers and sisters, you understand 
it, I will not at all be chafed if you come up to me afterwards and say, I, I don't know that I agree with your read on verse 15. It's entirely possible, as, as I've studied this passage for years now, um, that there are, because there are literally hundreds of slightly different interpretations, it's entirely possible that I could present one of those to you and you would be convinced by it. It's entirely possible that one of them might convince me one day. <laughs> But there's nothing that Paul says here, and there's nothing that Paul means here that's wrong or that's bad. So, having admitted my own ignorance and inviting you to second-guess me, what do I think verse 15 says? Why do I think that this is relevant to the conversation of the character of our church's women? I think Paul means this. Dear sisters, women of a healthy church are to accept the wisdom and love of God's plan for you as women. You are are to understand more and more, but also to embrace and rejoice in God's plan for you as a woman. Look again at verse 15. Every Christian will be saved as they persevere in faith until the end. As we all cultivate and and see growth in faith and love and holiness and self-control. Those are not women's issues. But not every Christian will be saved through childbearing, that particularly weird phrase. What do I, I think Paul is saying here? I think Paul means to take the word childbearing as a summary of everything it means to be a woman that's uniquely feminine in this world. Y'all know me. I'm I'm no culture warrior. My my only aim is is to preach the truth of Jesus with love. I know this this statement is going to sound like a culture warrior um, talking heads on the news statement, but it does need to be said for clarity's sake. It is a it's a biological impossibility for a non-woman to bear children. Childbearing is uniquely connected to being a woman. So piecing all that together, I think Paul is saying that women are saved the same way men are. By grace and through faith, which produces a life that is marked by growing love and growing obedience to God. But women are saved as women. In the wisdom and power and love of God, our sexes and our genders are not interchangeable. We, we cannot swap out a man for a woman or vice versa in everything in life. God, sister, listen to me. God personally and he powerfully and he intentionally made each one of us as we are, which is not just our preferences and our talents in life. That goes down to your X and Y chromosomes. And that is not an easy pill to swallow. That's a simple thing to understand. It can, can sometimes be kind of a hard thing to embrace, right? It is my understanding that childbearing is not for wimps. I've watched it happen four times. My great accomplishment was that during one of them, I ate an entire family bag of trail mix. I think our experiences were different that day. So bringing a joke to a serious topic, it is not easy to bear the responsibility of being a woman. All the more so not a Christian woman. But sister, let me, let me invite you to consider this. If you can take God at his word, that he came into the world to redeem you, and that he lived all of his life as your substitute and your example, that th- this God who made you bled out on a cruel cross, and that he was raised honest to God from the dead after three days so that you could be restored to him, if you can take him at his word that all of that is true, could you also accept that your calling as a woman is real? That it's actually good. Even with the problems that really are created by it. And the particular ways that 
the curse of sin affects you. Could, could you take it on faith that this God is telling you the truth for your good? I, I use that phrase, taking God at his word. That's, that's really simply my way of explaining what the Bible calls faith. Sister, if you have faith in God and in his word, you will be saved now and forever. And that faith will have real-world implications for how you conduct your life in church gatherings and in every other sphere that God's called you to, at home, in your neighborhood, in your family and friends, at work, in the greater world. Even if you are one of those many women who struggle with infertility and may not ever experience childbearing, if you embrace your role as a woman in Jesus' church, as uniquely called and gifted, as a daughter of God and a little sister to Jesus, if you embrace that life as a part of your humble submission to God and to the good news of Jesus, you, sister, will not go to hell. You will be rescued. You will be delivered and ransomed by this good God, you will be saved from all evil, from all suffering forever in the new heavens and earth that we all long for, where your big brother Jesus will one day gather all of God's people to himself in a renewed, restored creation. So with all of the suffering that that really does and really might entail, sisters, focus on God's calling for you, a calling that I and our brothers will not ever have to face. That focus is not only part of your health as a disciple, y'all, it is key to the health of one Savior and to any church that exists to hold up and support the good news about Jesus, not just with what we teach and what we say, but with our whole lives. Let me invite Hillary and Danae up to lead us and to serve us um, as we sing, and prepare to come to this table. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If your sermon cannot naturally lead into communing with Jesus at his table, it's probably not a good sermon. Sisters and brothers, we come to a humble Jesus who is focused on the needs of others and on his absolutely unique calling in life which was not for his own glory per se, but for the good, well, let's use his words from John chapter 6. His calling was for the life of the world. We come to this Jesus and his life at this table by faith, and it is for all of us who take Jesus at his word to forgive us and to change us. So if you're listening to me now, friends, if you have come to trust in Jesus, and if trusting in Jesus has changed your life, if you've been baptized into his church and you're in good standing with your local church, then we invite you to share this table with us. If you don't follow Jesus yet, do you realize this morning we as a church are so honored to host you? This, this morning and every other opportunity that we have, it is our privilege to play guest to you as God speaks to you. But that same God who speaks to you says that anyone who eats and drinks from this table in an unworthy manner is guilty of a terrible thing. And so, please feel free to stay in your seats while the rest of us come to either one of these tables and take the bread and the cup back to our seats singing. And after we finish this song, we'll eat and drink together celebrating this humble Savior, Jesus Christ. So let me now invite you, if you are able to stand, stand and sing. And brothers and sisters, come to the table.